I'm ready when you are. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Um, this is the, what? gosh, is it December? It's practically like March. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is the, the December um, ADHDKC parent meeting. Um, I'm Jeremy Didier. I'm the co-founder of ADHDKC along with Kristen Steppy. And uh, we are really excited that you guys are here. Um, we are recording the meeting, just so you know, you probably got a notice when you came in. Um, go ahead and leave your, your microphones off if you can, and you're welcome to leave your camera on or off. It's up to you, whatever you're more comfortable with. If you have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat. And just remember that uh, as Chad, we do not endorse or support or recommend any one provider, medication, treatment, or product. That's our disclaimer. We are so thrilled that our presenter tonight is the fabulous Beckham Linton. And if you have not ever heard Beckham speak before, you are in for a treat. She is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, she works at Heartland Social Learning Center, and she is a social cognitive specialist and an ADHD uh, and relationship coach. And let's see. Beckham started out as a speech language pathologist, and she did that for almost three decades, which is crazy because she doesn't look a day over 30. <laughs> I'm going to be a grandmother next month. You are? Oh my gosh, congratulations. That's so awesome. That's phenomenal. Um, and then uh, let's see, you are a certified member of the American Speech and Hearing Association. You're a member of the Social Thinking Speakers Collaborative, which is um, a really amazing organization. They do great things. Um, she is a certified ADHD coach through ADCA, which is where I became an ADHD coach also. So recommend that. And a certified relationship coach through RCI, which is the Relationship Coaching Institute. And I can say that Beckham has changed my two sons with ADHD and autism's lives so much for the better because Aww. she taught them social skills. And uh, the, the only reason my sophomore in college has friends now is because of Beckham. <laughs> I, I doubt that, I'm sure. Well, I mean, you. without your help, I guarantee things would be much different. So Thank take you. it away, Beckham. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here and am impressed with all of us for showing up on time using our executive function skills. Woohoo! So uh, this topic uh, is something that I have to I have to work on not sharing too much information. That's one of my challenges I'm forever working on. So I have a lot to cover tonight um, in 45 minutes, which uh, over a topic, executive function and the social mind, pulling it all together. This could technically be a three-day conference, so just bear with me, and uh, I'll give you some time at the end to ask questions and welcome anyone to contact me after tonight if you have if you want to speak further on any of this. So let's get into it. Um, here we go. So executive functions. Let's look at just the basic definition. They are a set of processes that have to do with managing oneself and one's resources in order to achieve a goal. It's an umbrella term for the neurologically based skills involving mental control and self-regulation. It involves these primary processes, stress tolerance, emotional control, response inhibition, you can read the rest, um, all of these have kind of sub steps underneath. So you can just by this slide tell how complex this idea of executive functions is. So when we, let me back up here. When we look at like around here, you know, time management, sustained attention, working memory, and this idea of organization, um, Many of us immediately think organization or lack of organization skills. My child is not organized in their homework. They forget time. Their room is a mess. So that that type of organization is valid. But for, for tonight, we're going to talk about actually two types. We're thinking of organized thinking. So when you think of executive functions and organization, we have two types. The first is static organization. So this is always structured. It is, there's permanence of place or placement, permanence of time on a schedule, and it's very highly predictable, this type of 
um, executive function organization. So for example, where to put your clothes in your room, the structure of our binders, you know, Monday we get our spelling words and Wednesday we're, we're given the test, bedtime, hygiene routines. Um, I added pickleball game every Saturday in the morning. That is one of my static organization tasks. And then there is dynamic organization. And this is, it requires us to constantly make adjustments and shift our thinking, our priority, our workload, time commitments, the tasks that we're doing, the places we do them in. And examples of this would be just all the unpredictable assignments that pop up in our child's day. The long-term assignments are different from those regular weekly assignments. Um, working in groups of different people um, and their different personalities, having to organize around the spontaneous needs of family activities at home, binder management. And I'm seeing a lot of kids struggle with just communicating with their teachers, understanding how each teacher wants assignments to be turned in. Um, that can be tricky online, in person, so there is that. And the dynamic org organization starts to trip our kids up around fifth grade and beyond. So when I say our students or our kids, I am going to be referring to kids who have social, emotional, and academic learning challenges. So I wanna be clear about, about that. So our kids are those kids uh, with those challenges. So the social mind requires the same executive functions as those required to do any kind of a task. It requires perspective taking, goal setting, action planning, thinking flexibly, shifting, working memory, problem solving, you know, prioritizing, time management. Think about those things that you had to do to actually get here tonight. The people that you had to talk to. Um, the, those executive functions that that we use as adults every every day, but if you want to get get together with your friends on the weekend, we have to use all of these executive function processes. So what is social? What does social mean? We have lots of different terms for this idea of social. We call it social communication, social cognition social thinking, social skills. And so what we're talking about tonight is the ability to consider or think about our own and other people's thoughts, emotions, beliefs, their intentions, their past experiences, so that we can interpret what we're taking in and respond to that information in our minds and maybe through our behaviors, our social behavioral interactions. So just that definition alone kind of shows that it's more than just a skill. It is a thinking process. So um, social thinking, the, the methodology and Michelle Winner has created this social competency model that is a beautiful illustration of what we are we all do every day and socially um, using our executive function skills. So if you can picture this as an iceberg, and this is the water line, the tip of the iceberg is where our social skills are. Those are the behaviors that we witness other people doing. Um, at that tip of the iceberg. But below the surface are all of the cognitive processes, executive functions that are needed in order for us to decide what skill to apply in any given moment. So it starts down here with social attention. So being able to take in information from your environment, the physical space, the people in it, and gain all, just take it all in so that we can next interpret what is expected in that moment in order for us all to share space effectively together. And so this is where we're thinking, what are the hidden rules 
right now? What are the hidden ex expectations? How am I supposed to function and what am I supposed to do next in this situation? Then once we've kind of interpreted, all right, this is what's happening. The problem solving level is where flexible thinking happens. It's where our minds consider all the options. Well, I could do this. I could do that. I could do that. I could do this. We're considering those options, thinking flexibly, and then we make a decision based on everything going on in our minds as to what is the best skill to apply in that moment. And then we do it again. And we're constantly dynamically organizing our, our thinking around what's happening uh, in any given situation. And in addition to all that, we are monitoring, uh, thinking about ourselves, evaluating ourselves, evaluating other people, and managing our sensory input. We're managing our anxiety or just sadness all that emotion that comes with uh, being around people. And even, you know, the screen time overload is becoming a thing. So when you look at this, it's no wonder our students reach this fight, flight, or freeze state in a number of situations. And we see these behaviors um, or lack of good, you know, expected social skills because of their lagging skills somewhere in this process. So uh, I don't know if many of you probably have heard of Dr. Ross Green. He is, uh, he's written several books, Lost at School and The Explosive Child. And he, his mantra is all kids do well if they can. And when they don't do well or meet the expectations, it's because those expectations exceed the child's skill level. So our, and it shows up in behavior, but our jobs as educators and parents um, are to teach our students to feel more comfortable with discomfort and to make shift happen. How do we do that? Well, we have to, in order to kind of facilitate and teach these executive functions, we have to find ways to break things down before we build them up. So this is an example. I worked in an elementary school where uh, the principal, the, the school motto was be nice. And everybody knows what be nice means, but when you get down to the daily grind of how are you, you know, what means nice, that requires all of us to read the room, to take perspective, to think about other kids and when to help and when not to help. You know, um, you've got to have those executive function. And, you know, I hear a lot of kids who want to help other students in their class because they see they're struggling. But if that's, if that student does not want the help, that it's best to just leave them alone until they're until they ask. So all of that requires executive function as well. So we've got to break it down to help them build it up. Now, for my understanding, executive functions, we can break down this concept of executive functions into these primary parts. The first part is being able to think about the future of something that we want or we need to do. The second step is we have to create sequenced or even parallel steps to help us accomplish that. The third part is we have to regulate our emotions when things get in our way and interrupt our flow or our plan. And, and we have to think flexibly throughout all of these steps. Um, because we, the best laid plans will always, there will be an interruption. So I like to think of this in its fundamental parts. This is goal-directed behavior, executive functions. Um, there is a gal named Sarah Ward to, and her cohort is Kristen Jacobson. 
they have a website called Cognitive Connections and have created a, this strategy. And we don't, you know, this could be a, a whole day talk, but it's a strategy called Get Ready, Do Done. And you can locate it on their um, website where in any task that we're trying to help a child accomplish, whether it's cleaning their room or making cookies or doing a long-term project, we always start with done. What does it look like when it's done? What will it look like? And we go to the point of actually having the kids sketch it out or take pictures. If you're having them clean their room, you might want to clean their room first and then take a picture of what that looks like when you consider it done so that their done matches your done. And then once you decide, okay, this is what done looks like, you determine, all right, what are the steps I need to take to get there? And you can bring in these time elements in the conversation. You know, when are you going to start? When does it have to be done? But then also thinking, how long will I, how long do I predict it'll take me to make my bed or to uh, gather up all my laundry or to throw the trash out? That time estimation is also building that executive function of just time awareness and feeling the passage of time. You can even test them out. Well, I think it'll take me 15 minutes and then you time yourself and it actually took 10 or, or less. Um, and then you move over to what are the, who are the people and the supplies or materials that I need to, to actually get this done. So I, that this helps us organize our thinking around any task, and there, you know, the the complexity of the task obviously makes this process a little more complex. But it's a nice way of attacking a task. Um, okay, so this first strategy. This is a quick overview of executive functioning, and these next two things are strategies that we can use um, to help facilitate executive function development in our children, but also build up our own skills. And, you know, obviously teaching our children requires us to use self-control, perspective taking, all of these time management. Um, we're having to really hone our executive function skills to help our kids. So this first strategy, is called declarative language. And it is a conversational strategy that really does promote critical thinking and socially based executive function skills. So I'm gonna first start by talking about the opposite of declarative language, which is imperative language. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this one. So when we all, all of us make demands or give directions, ask direct questions, that is okay. That's uh, appropriate for many of our students, neurotypical students. Sometimes our students with social emotional learning challenges get tripped up and, and being asked a direct question or given a direct, uh, a direction, just we may get a deer in the headlight kind of look or that fight, flight, or freeze response. It just makes them often feel inadequate because they can't provide an answer. So that's what this imperative language is. It is imperative that a response is given. And many of our students just don't have what it takes, the processing speed. They may have heard an incomplete info, you know, message. What For whatever reason, they can't produce and respond to us in an expected way. So questions like, why did you do that? Or a direction, go clean your room, feed the dog, what'd you do today? Um, we will often get resistance. So some examples of this imperative type of language, um, did you clean your room? We might get a fight response, you know, where our kids just start melting down or kicking or screaming or, you know, running away, protesting, I don't wanna do it or say hello to grandma. They, you may see our children, you know, hiding, running under the table, just ignoring, acting like they didn't even hear you. Or, you know, tell me about your day. 
And so many of our kids will just give us one word responses. Oh, it's fine. Fine. It's okay. And these, each one of these, you can see kind of requires the student to respond pretty quickly. So declarative language is simply a comment or a statement that observes the environment, including the people and the actions, any changes happening in your environment. It also um, kind of narrates our own thinking, um, our opinions, our predictions, just our thoughts and feelings about what's happening in that moment. Uh, so it also, we use for declarative language a lot of these cognitive verbs that represent thinking. Um, you know, I, th I think that I might do this tomorrow, or I wonder what happened there, or I remember we did this. I wonder if we could try that again. Um, using these words as we're speaking about our own thoughts with our kids helps them think about thinking, which is, a, a very fundamental part of that executive function and metacognition. So we also, in declarative language, it's helpful to use words of uncertainty. So can we do this, mom? Can we go to the store and get some candy? Um, might say, well, maybe, possibly, uh, perhaps, or even just saying, I, I'm not really sure right now. You're still bringing in that thinking vocabulary, but um, so many of our kids are uh, require that high structure and they may be very rigid around some meaning of some of these words, these, uh, and, and can be very black and white thinkers. So bringing in this language as we're communicating with our kids on a daily basis can help them, uh, it just exposes them to uh, more abstract, concepts of, well, it's it's not just right or wrong, it might be just right in the middle, that gray area of language. So for example, just saying, you know, all right, everybody get in line, you're giving that direction, that imperative direction. It kind of robs our kids of the opportunity to notice the big picture on their own and figure out what to do. Instead, Declarative language, it invites the students to observe their surroundings and to maybe even share the clues that you're paying attention to. For example, oh, hey, your friends are lining up. Let's see if they beat the bell. So you're drawing their attention to it's time to line up, but you're not telling them exactly, go do that or um, giving them a direction because so many of our kids especially with ADHD, the maverick in them comes out as soon as you give them a direction. Even if it's something they may want to do, if you tell them to do it, they're going to dig in their heels. And I'm imagining maybe you guys are nodding your heads right now, thinking of kids in your lives going, yeah, that's right. So more examples here of imperative language. Say hello to grandmother. That's a direction. Declarative might just sound like, oh, look, grandma's driving up the driveway. Um, instead of saying, you know, what color is your shirt? Requiring that immediate response. You could say something like, oh, hi, I have um, the same color shirt. I like red too. Again, you're commenting on what you're noticing. Um, look at me. I mean, we've all said this, right? We all use imperative language. Um, and I do this a lot. Look at me, you know, make sure you you are listening. Instead, say something like, you know, I worried you might be you might miss something um, if your head is looking down. And I really want you to be part of our group. Um, again, it's a statement. Now, you're not going to get the positive response you're looking for just because you're using declarative language. I will say that, right? Your kids aren't just gonna magically start doing everything you want them to do. However, they are, I would put money on the fact that when you use declarative language, they are listening and they are thinking about what you are saying. 
even if they don't necessarily respond in the way that you had hoped right then, this takes time, but it kind of uh, helps relax the playing field, so, so to speak, and help reduce a child's anxiety of having to perform. I mean, even just asking some of our kids, would you like spaghetti or lasagna for dinner tonight? And so many of our of our students have a hard time sharing an opinion. But when you think about what has to happen cognitively, they have to think about everything I know about spaghetti and everything I know about lasagna, compare and contrast, find the similarities and differences, and then decide, have the self-awareness enough to know what do I like better? That is a very complex cognitive process to be able to spit out an answer really quickly. And so many of our kids just say, I don't care. I don't know. You decide. Um, that's not being difficult. It's because they're just stuck. They have lagging skills in this area. So using declarative language and, and during that whole process, their anxiety is, is up because everybody's waiting for their answer, right? So um, declarative language does kind of help uh, lessen the pressure, so to speak. Um, I'm guilty of doing this. You know, you'll, you'll explain something to a student and then check for comprehension. So does that make sense? And they'll say, uh-huh. Yep. And then I'll say, okay, so what did I say? Can you tell me in your own words? And that is very imperative. And I do that. And many times kids cannot give me the answer. They can't repeat it back to me. And that makes them feel bad. And I feel bad. So um, I've been really trying to start saying, you know, I'm wondering if you heard what I said, or I want to be sure you're included in our conversation and, and don't feel lost at the end when, when you have to start, you know, following that direction and participate. So it's amazing how, when you use declarative statements, I'm noticing kids will look at me a lot more spontaneously without me asking. They will want to share my ideas and my thoughts and will often take action without really, you know, feeling like I'm giving them a direction. So when we talk about declarative language um, and executive function, so, um, Developing our inner coach, our inner voice, that strategy of self-talk is something all of us do, but um, this is particularly helpful when we're teaching kids to think about thinking, is to simply talk out loud as we're working through problems. If we, you know, pondering um, new ideas or possibilities, doing that out loud with your, with your kids. You know, I lost my keys. I think the last time I saw them, they were in my car before I brought the groceries in. Maybe they're still out there. Um, you're not expecting the, the student to respond to you in any way, but they're listening and hearing you verbally problem solve. That inner voice is what we need to execute um, socially, social communication. Declarative language also is really helpful in, in uh, fostering perspective taking, which is that understanding that, uh, understanding and awareness that we all have different thoughts and opinions and feelings and perspectives, and we can have different uh, ideas, but they're not less. So uh, as well, as an example, an imperative statement might be, you know, stop drawing, please, and look at me. So that's giving them a direction um, where you're expecting a response. Declarative statement might be, I'll wait until I know that we are all sharing the same thoughts. Just saying that, or I'll wait until I know everyone is listening. You're not telling them to look up or everybody listen, sit up straight. You're just stating what you're gonna do. And it's amazing 
how when kids hear you, they will adjust without being asked. Or when you're reading a book or looking at a movie, watching a movie, making a declarative statement about another character's thinking. You know, I wonder what that character is thinking right now. Um, again, you're just making a comment, but oftentimes over time when the students are feeling comfortable, they will chime in and begin um, sharing a conversation with you. Uh, problem solving um, and episodic- I have a question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, in that example that you gave of spaghetti versus lasagna, mm -hmm. how could you make that into a declarative statement? Um, you could maybe or talk like about, well, just talk out loud about perhaps your thinking, you know, oh, well, you know, I, I really like, I'm thinking spaghetti tonight, but it's so messy and we can't have meatballs and I really love meatballs. So lasagna is a little more compact. I, I think I'm going to choose lasagna. I like lasagna better, but I wonder what everyone else is thinking. So Got you're okay, demonstrating, you know, letting them hear how you're thinking about it um, and then right. throw it out there. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, can you repeat that back to me so I know that it made sense? <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so this idea of using memory and problem solving, um, using declarative language to kind of foster that. Um, I remember the last time you left your homework at home, we emailed your teacher. Um, instead, like, again, I think about trying to do homework, help my son with his homework or my daughter. And I would sit there and say, so what is it that you need to do? What did the teacher tell you? All of these imperative statements. And they're just like, I don't know. And just talking about your own memories. Well, I remember when I was in this situation, I tried this. Maybe maybe we should do that. Um, if they don't remember, you can just say, you know, let's let's try that again. Um, declarative language for kind of fostering reading the room, that situational awareness. Um, imperative might be put on your snow boots and get in line versus a declarative statement might be, and this really happened the other day. Um, I remember many of you could not play in the snow yesterday without your boots and your gloves. So I hope you all have fun outside today. You know, so you're just commenting on what you remember, but these kids are listening and it's amazing how they will, they will critically think about that and then make a decision. Now, again, not all of our kids will do this perfectly, but this is where we have to use our executive functions and perspective taking and take what we know about our students and back up. We, they may need to have it broken down a little bit more. Um, so this is not just a stamp saying, this is what you do and this is what will happen. We have to flex in our own thinking based on the responses that we're getting from from our kids that we're working with. Um, another idea about differing opinions and fostering that idea that we all have different opinions and that's okay and we can still work around it. Sharing some of the language in these situations, like I've never thought about it that way and I'd love to hear more or we think differently about that. Or wow, you're a big Eagles fan. We are different in that in that way. Um, and I, I like this kind of statement here at the bottom. I wonder if your friend likes pretzels as much as you do. That is uh, really fostering curiosity and just helping the child wonder about their friend, what they like, what they don't like compared to themselves. And that is the essence of perspective taking that is required for sharing space socially and connecting with other people. Um, this idea of accepting mistakes, so many of our students um, really don't even try new things for fear of making a mistake or not knowing it versus making guesses. So some declarative statements 
around this might be, oops, you know, just talking about your own mistakes. Oops, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted blueberries, my bad. Or yikes, I took a wrong turn. Let's go around another way. Hey, let's go on an adventure. I know we're gonna get back eventually. Or hmm, that's that's a tricky word for a lot of people to spell. Let's take another look at how to how to spell that word. So words like let's take another look, let's try again. That is fostering this idea of co-regulation where you're doing something to solve a problem together. Um, and this is more just declarative statements like I'm sure you can handle that mistake or I remember making this mistake one time and I'm here to help you if if you need it, just ask me um, or I'll bet you'll figure it out. I'm here. I'm here for you. So just a basic review, when you think about changing imperative statements to declarative, um, you're changing questions to comments. So tell me about your day or how was your day, dear? Instead, you could say something about your own day. Like I tripped at the grocery store today, so I hope your day was smoother than mine. So you're kind of throwing it out there and giving them a starter sentence. And oftentimes they'll just sit there and say nothing, but you know they're thinking about it. And it may come up later as they've processed it. Um, an imperative statement, what is missing here? A declarative, your feet might get cold without your shoes on in this cold room or something. Or what do you need? That's very imperative. Declarative might be, uh, it's time for math. You need a lot of, uh, a few things in that class don't you? Or where you're just throwing out ideas that you're having. So uh, a, a colleague of mine, Linda Murphy, has written this book, Declarative Language Handbook, that is fabulous. She's also written um, Declarative Language and Co-Regulation on how to set things up with your children so that you're doing things together and building that language in specific scenarios. So um, that, that is a really great reference. So um, that is the first strategy, declarative language that I wanted to share with you tonight. Are there any questions before I show my second strategy? Okay, pretty quiet. So um, again, I know this is a lot, but um, if, We'll just keep going and then throw it out there. So I um, completed my relationship coaching certificate a couple of years ago and found this communication map through that experience. And it may be a little hard to see, but I'm going to break this down for you. So this communication map is really for us adults um, to have better, more effective communication. I mean, my my vision is for us parents and teachers who need to communicate closely with other adults around a specific student or child. Um, this initially was meant for just people in in loving relationships, but regardless of whether you are, you know, living together or separate, if you are co-parenting uh, with anyone, that is the relationship that needs to be nurtured and this map can really help with. So um, so I'll get into it. Uh, it. It kind of assigns roles. There's a receiver and a sender, and there are rules of the road and things that, these four things that help us, uh, that cause us to hit a wall in our communication. So I'm gonna start with the rules of the road. Now, I will preface this by just saying, you know, again, this is not something that you're going to achieve perfection while using, um, but it's a guideline. So, you know, and it takes practice, but if you and your, your parenting partner are um, up for just, thinking about the rules of the road when you're talking and nothing else, then that's going to be a help as you practice and move forward talking, you know, about the conflicts and issues that you have. So 
Rules of the road, issues are unmet needs. And all issues are valid. The person with the unmet need owns that issue. They are the sender, the person coming saying, okay, I've got an issue. They must own that issue. This is a step that is tricky to, to practice, um, but it, it, it's very helpful. Getting your head around ownership of my issue. Take turns being the sender and, and talking about only one issue at a time. Both people speak with moderation. And that means pausing for a minute, take a breath, watching your volume and watch the content of your words, you know, just monitoring yourself. That is executive functioning all over, written all over. Listen with curiosity. Uh, assume that there is a win-win. And this last one is so important, nurturing the space between. Really, well, so that's my timer. See, I, I'm going to get through this. So just respecting your roles as co-parents. So the wall, these four things are what help, you know, make us just our communication fall apart as a sender or a receiver, where we're coming at it with judgment, like I'm judging you based on what I'm thinking, not about the facts, uh, interpreting intent without all the facts, coming at it from a very defensive place and reacting very emotionally. These are these four things that if we can keep in check will get us so much farther down the road in, in our communication, you just won't believe. So uh, in this map, the sender, the person sending the issue, the person with the issue, it's all about you as the sender. If you have the issue, this is all about you. You've got to check in second step to see, all right, am I, you know, am I checking the judgment, the interpretation, defensiveness, and emotion? I we've got to self-reflect and use those executive skills to really check in with ourselves to make sure, all right, am, am I managing my emotions before I bring this up? You identify or state the issue. This is where the actual conversation comes in and I'll show you what the receiver's role is in a minute. You make a request without worried about how it will be done, the outcome, but you just ask for what it is you would like to see happen. Um, there you negotiate and then follow through. So again, this is not, you know, like clockwork, but the biggest pieces of this are checking in with yourself, identify the issue and keep it positive. So as the receiver, we have to remember if we're hearing this from your partner, your parenting partner, uh, it's not about you. The sender might be coming at you with judgment or a raised voice or sounding irritated, but we have to remember as the receiver that this really isn't about me. She or he is the one with the issue and they have a need that's not met. Let's see if I can actually help meet this need for them. Being curious, tell me more, help me understand, is that all? Um, being compassionate, trying to just validate what they're telling you and just mirror and then, and coach like, okay, so keep telling me, keep helping me understand where you're coming from. So this isn't a very good example, but I'm gonna struggle through it anyway. So let's say that the sender is saying, you know, you came home late and there was no call. The receiver may ask, is, is my lateness the issue that you're having? 
the risk, the sender is no, I'm, I was worried and anxious when you didn't call. So the receiver is saying, so is me not calling the issue? Well, the sender is like, no, actually I cooked a really great meal and I spent a lot of money and time on it. And now it's spoiled and I couldn't share it with you. And I was looking forward to spending some time with you. So you can go from you're late and you didn't call to, wow, I really was looking forward to spending some time with you is the real issue. And I need, I need to spend time with you. I don't know. It, it can be anything, but the sender has to communicate and, and answer the questions of the receiver and the receiver that role is to help facilitate, always asking for more information. That's where this coaching comes in, where as coaches, we're always trying to dig down to the real issue. Just dig, dig, dig by asking questions and trying to learn more about where, about another person's perspective. This is social executive functioning. So once again, you know, when you get better at this, you start checking in with yourself. Right now, I'm judging you and this is not a good time to talk. <laughs> or I'm feeling really defensive by how you're talking to me. So can we, you know, let's chill out. Um, you know, right now I'm interpreting what you, that you did this on purpose, or I'm feeling really emotional right now. These, these are some, you know, declarative statements actually that, um, might help when you recognize where you are um, on this wall and can kind of back up and regulate so that you can come together later when you're both ready. And this is just one that when you, uh, this this slide did not, uh, does not communicate what I was thinking here, but this talkers versus thinkers, once again, you have to think socially about the person, you know, your, your parenting partner, I'll just call them. This could happen with other people, but um, if you know that your partner is more of a talker and they verbally process through everything, you may need to be in the headspace of, I need to let them just get it out and wait for the pause. And before I need, before I ask any more questions, or if you know, your partner is more of a thinker, then you want to just share your issue, take a minute, step back, let them think about it and work on it and then come back. So it's it's your social awareness and understanding of your partner and who they are um, that can allow us to use our executive functions, emotional control to give them that space that we know they need. Uh, I'm going to skip through. So this is just, uh, you know, a map to give you some ideas for how to communicate more effectively around these critical topics, especially around parenting a child. Um, it's not easy. We have to be patient. Perfection is not a thing. It doesn't exist. So however this works for you, go for it. Um, use it as a guideline um, when communicating is, is a little more scary <laughs> or difficult. Um, and there are a few points that maybe you can read on your own. I'll go through them really quick and then we'll have questions. So always be asking, is there more? Tell me more. I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, remember, as the receiver, this is not about me. Even though they may sound accusatory, this is their issue. But as the sender, this is all about you. This is your issue. We've got to own our issues. Um, to try to turn complaints into requests. Um, working on, you know, instead of focusing on what's wrong, try to just focus on what you would like to see happen. And, uh, and kind of negotiate, there always can be a win-win. You're not gonna get everything you want, but once again, we have to use our emotional regulation, problem-solving skills, prioritizing, all of these executive functions to be able to communicate with each other if we want to teach our kids to do the same thing. 
and tell your truth. We just have to be honest with ourselves and with each other about all kinds of things. In order to have intimacy, I like the breakdown, into me I see. Um, we have to just respect and love us for who we are as a team, um, whether we live together or not. If you are co-parenting um, a child, then that is the space to be nurtured and loved and respected. Um, what you do outside of that role is something different completely. So um, here is a, the, if you want to learn more about the communication map, this is the link to the Relationship Coaching Institute um, that I can put up in later. I think that's all I have actually. So yeah, we need to survive before we can thrive um, and just build on this. So whew, that was, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't too much, but it was great. Are you kidding? I learned something every time you're, I was teasing back and before when she sent her slides over, I was like, that's a lot of slides. <laughs> she, <laughs> she said, I think I can do it. I'm like, I'm yeah, we'll see. <laughs> You <laughs> totally nailed it. Get a drink of water. <laughs> <coughs> Who has questions for Becca? You can post them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and, and ask them. We're just going to try to go one at a time so that um, we don't talk over each other. So if you do have a question and you want to raise your hand, we can go that way or you can type it in the chat and I can ask it for you. You covered it all, it looks like. There's no questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it. They got it. They're gonna take it and run with it. Expert level. I love it. Um, I know I had some questions. <laughs> Let me go back and see what I forgot to ask. I was gonna write it down. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> Can you say more about like, I guess apologizing when you screw up as being the parent? you know, when maybe you don't use the best language or you can't remember the tools that we learned today? Oh, like if you make a mistake and your child calls you on it. Sorry. Yeah. Boy. Or when you make a mistake and, and you know, you made a mistake. Well, I mean, that's the perfect time to just state when you think about declarative language, making comments on your own internal thoughts and opinions, mm -hmm. you know, saying something like, I feel so embarrassed when those words came out. I was not in control of my language mm -hmm. and I'm embarrassed that you heard me. So I'm sorry for that. I like that. So, you know, you're, you're illustrating and demonstrating how to apologize in a real mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and giving them the language. So yeah. they may not accept your apology right then and there, <laughs> but they're thinking about it and they are listening and think of think about it critically and it will come up later when they need to apologize. Good, I like that. Um, Allison wants to know if you can talk a little bit more about how to apply the sender receiver model when the receivers are young adults with ADHD. Yes. So. The sender receiver, I mean, it's something that before you begin using, before you start trying to use this communication map, there needs to be a discussion about the rules of the road, so to speak. You know, I've had some families, um, like I said, take bits and pieces of this map based on what works for them. So um, I've had a couple of families take some of those rules of the road and create their own and maybe even post it in the living room um, or even those four, uh, those four conditions that make us hit a wall. So are you thinking uh, more when the receivers are young adults with ADHD? When you're, I mean, it kind of depends on the, relationship to, um, I would suggest really talking first. If you're able to say, you know, I'd like to kind of work on how we communicate 
And what do you think if, you know, what I'm thinking actually, instead of asking them, just saying, I'm thinking about having just kind of some rules for the road, or you can call it whatever you want and list the things that, that you both want to really practice. Um, and I'd start with just one or two at first. Um, and you know, if you get their buy-in, then they can participate and add, add more ideas as you begin to communicate better. Does that answer your question? She says, yes, thank sure. you. Yeah, in a lot of ways, parenting um, young adult children with ADHD is more challenging than parenting young children <laughs> with ADHD. Oh, very much so, very much so. Yeah. And, you know, even young adults, I mean, structure binds anxiety. Mm. And so anytime there can be structure or that predictability, even mm -hmm. conversation, I mean, conversations are very unpredictable. It's not like a ping pong game because they can go anywhere. And that's why so many folks are uncomfortable with conversations, but can talk all day in their video games with people because they there's a level of predictability in those games. They know what the topic is. They know the people. They, you know, they don't have to get too deep into personal introspection or perspective taking. So, you know, this idea of creating some rules for the road. Um, provide some structure in those spontaneous conversations that might increase the comfort. That makes sense. Anybody else have a question before we wrap things up for the night? Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Next month, we're going to be meeting towards the beginning of the month. Um, and we're going to, my my partner and good friend, Jane Endergaard from uh, North Dakota is going to be presenting on uh, siblings uh, when you live in a family or are parenting a family where one or two of your kids has ADHD and maybe the other one or two do not have ADHD and how to navigate that. Cause that can be pretty challenging. And then later in the month, we are sponsoring along with um, several other mental health organizations in the area, uh, a, a film about suicide and suicide prevention. And it's going to be a very powerful event. Um, so check out our website and our Facebook page for more information. The, the film is called My Ascension, which is confusing because uh, <laughs> there's my kids go to Ascension. Yeah. So my Ascension is something very different than Ascension Catholic School. It's a really powerful and moving story about um, a young woman who uh, was struggling with depression and what happened next. Um, and we're, we're going to have a, an expert panel afterwards with mental health professionals uh, to talk about what was in the film and ways that you can help uh, people in your own family should they be struggling with depression or suicidal thoughts. Beckham, thank you so much for everything. This was phenomenal. I always love hearing you present. Have a great yeah. holiday, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again for being here. You bet. See you later. Okay. There we go. Stop the recording. Did I stop the recording? Oh, stop the recording.